Hi, tonight we're going to talk about Chapter 14, Substance Use Disorders and Gambling Disorders. Just to give you a little overview, we're going to define some of the substance abuse disorders that are present in the DSM-5, uh, talk about a few classes of uh, substances, and finish up reviewing a little bit on gambling disorders. Let's start off with this graph. I think what's most meaningful, um, let's get the slideshow the full length of the screen. I think what's most meaningful about this uh, graph is it gives you a good idea about how prevalent illicit drug use is in the United States, um, and it divides it amongst ethnic and age groups. You can see that ethnic and age, different ethnic and age groups have different rates of use. Nearly one half of the U.S. population admits to having tried Ill illegal substances at some point in their lives and about 14% used an illegal substance in the past year. In 2008, 15% of drivers admitted to driving under the influence of alcohol, and another 5% of drivers under the influence of illicit drugs. These are some of the um, criteria we use in diagnosing substance abuse. Um, substance use and gambling disorders. Uh, the criteria that we use now again is from the DSM-5. Substance use disorders have to involve a chronic difficulty involving either the use of substances or engaging in a level of gambling behavior that causes extreme distress or impairs one's functioning. We're going to be describing a substance as any natural or synthesized product that has psychoactive effects. What do we mean by psychoactive effects? It means it changes perceptions, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors for individuals. To diagnose a substance use or gambling disorder doesn't require physical dependence. We're going to talk a little bit about concept of physical dependence and how our bodies can get dependent on substances and experience both tolerance and withdrawal. But to, to make a diagnosis of substance use and gambling disorders, one does not need to have a physical dependence. What is required is that we have to display that there's a problem in the person's everyday functioning because of the use of drugs. And societies actually will differ greatly in their attitudes towards substances. And we're going to talk a little bit about this when we talk, when we think a little bit about the etiologies of substance use disorders. So what conditions do we look for when we're going to be defining or diagnosing a substance use disorder? The first thing we as practitioners look for is substance intoxication. So we want to assess whether the client is having any behaviors or psychological changes that occur as a result of the physiological effects of a substance on their central nervous system. Now these effects can change from one person to the next depending upon the type and amount of the substance that was ingested. It can vary depending upon the user's biochemistry including their tolerance level. It can change according to the setting. A lot of times the behaviors and psychological effects that we exhibit under uh, substance intoxication can vary whether or not we're at a party versus drinking alone. Uh, it can also influence whether we hurt others um, if we're driving or whether we are becoming more aggressive in the presence of under in other individuals. So again, depending upon whether we're accompanied by others or alone, the, the, the setting can have a huge impact on what type of physical behaviors we see when somebody's intoxicated. And then obviously the method of the injection, ingestion rather, of the drugs, whether they're injected or swallowed or smoked, can have different effects 
in terms of how quickly somebody becomes intoxicated. Other conditions that we assess for when we're, when we're defining substance use disorders and diagnosing substance use disorders, in addition to substance uh, intoxication, is both tolerance and substance withdrawal. Tolerance is defined as experiencing diminished effects from the same dose of a substance. So in other words, one needs more and more of a particular substance to achieve intoxic intoxication. And the more you use a substance, your higher, the higher your tolerance becomes. So the more and more drugs are going to be needed in order to feel the same desired effect. Substance withdrawal is a set of physiological and behavioral symptoms that result from a discontinuation of substances after a prolonged period of heavy use. And often they can, they can cause significant distress. Withdrawal symptoms are always usually the opposite of intoxication symptoms. So a drug that you ingest that makes you very euphoric, that makes you feel very elated, the withdrawal symptoms will actually be the exact opposite. They'll really make you feel crashed, depressed, and lethargic. Defining a substance abuse disorder, substance uh, abuse in DSM-4 diagnoses were given when use resulted in significant harmful consequences. This could have involved failure to meet obligations, uh, d you know, um, harmful consequences in using physically hazardous uh, substances get you in physically hazardous situations, could have resulted in legal problems or social problems. In the DSM-4, substance dependence was given to those individuals that met the criteria most often referred to as addiction. DSM-5, our most recent version of dsm actually changed how we look at substance use disorders and actually combined what was previously separate disorders as substance abuse and substance dependent and combined them into one diagnosis labeled substance use disorder. This slide is quite... Um, <clears throat> It really actually, um, I'm not sure what's, what's going on with it. Um, something in the recording software here is making it um, overlap. Well, let me describe a little bit. This um, slide is also uh, documented in table one of your book on page 393. So what we think about when we're dealing with criteria for substance abuse, substance use disorder is not only do we want to assess that the person has impaired control, um, but we also want to think about their use in terms of risky use. So the criteria for substance use disorder, we want to define the substance is taken in increasingly large amounts over a longer period of time than originally intended. So these are individuals that are frequently as clients describing how it's never that they want to get drunk. They usually just intend on drinking one beer or um, engaging in a small amount of drug use, but then their use over a longer period of time uh, quickly becomes more evident. It quickly becomes more chronic, and they quickly realize that they frequently overuse. Another criteria that we use to determine substance use disorder is that the substance user will crave the use of substances. The substance user will feel an ongoing desire to cut down or control their substance abuse, but have significantly difficulty doing that. And they'll also spend much of their time in obtaining, using, or recovering from the use of the substance. Also, the criteria for substance use disorder in DSM-5 involves a category of risky use. So the individual will engage in ongoing substance use despite getting in physically dangerous situations. And then they'll also use substances and they'll continue using those substances despite the awareness of any ongoing physical or psychological problems. 
So those are the two main categories in which we look for when we're defining substance use and assigning the disorder, is we want to see that there's an impaired control pattern in the use of how they're using the substance, and that use of that su substance poses significant risk. We also want to take a look at how much the substance use impairs uh, social impairment. Does the ongoing use of the substance result in an inability to meet responsibilities at home or work or school for the individual? Does the social, work-related, or other recreational activities, are they abandoned or cut back because of the substance use? And is there ongoing substance use despite recurring problems that might be caused or made worse by the effects of substances? We also look to some of the pharmacological criteria that's engaged in, in substance use disorder. We want to look for changes in the user's tolerance of the substance. We also look for withdrawal, and that withdrawal is demonstrated by characteristic withdrawal symptoms when they stop using the drug. So those four categories are what's present in the criteria for substance use disorder outlined in DSM-5. There's different classes of substances that DSM-5 recognizes. They recognize 10 substance classes. Um, and this chapter that we will be reading in our book really organizes them into actually five groups, the depressants, the stimulants, the opiates, hallucinogens, and the cannabis. So let's, we're just going to very quickly talk about each category. Generally, your depressants are drugs that slow the central nervous system. In moderate doses, one might experience some sleepiness, some relaxation, some reduced concentration, also can experience impairment in thinking, judgment, and motor skills. Uh, heavy doses of depressants can actually induce complete stupor or confusion um, or complete non-mobility in someone's uh, movement and, and often can result in death by really suppressing that central nervous system. Just some examples of um, intoxication and withdrawal that can happen from depressants. So there's a few common categories of depressants in this table. This table is also extracted from the book on page 394. Alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines are all examples of depressant drugs. As there's a list of intoxication symptoms here. Um, usually these drugs are marked by uh, profound sleepiness, uh, behavioral symptoms that can either include impaired judgment, mood lability or aggressive behavior, slurred speech, incognition, and often unsteady gait. Some of the withdrawal symptoms when you stop using the drug, uh, the drug abruptly can actually um, stimulate the central nervous system in a real dangerous way. Um, you might get some uh, hyperactivity in terms of that nerve, central nervous system, sweating, fast pulse, hand tremors, insomnia, nausea or vomiting, psychomotor agitation, anxiety. More significant would be heart issues and seizures. Um, I think the other thing to remember about the depressants is they're in toxic their, uh, can, their effect and their interaction with other drugs and other substances can often be quite fatal. Many people don't realize how dangerous it is to actually uh, use a depressant at the same time that you're engaged in, in other type of, of uh, substance use. The stimulants activate the central nervous system in, in, in a different way, causing feelings of energy, happiness, or power, a decreased desire for sleep, and a dis diminished appetite. Cocaine would be a good example, a pretty typical example of a stimulant. Other examples um, include uh, crack, which is a freebase cocaine that's actually boiled down. 
talk a little bit about amphetamines. Um, so these are stimulants. Um, they are in the category of stimulants, just like cocaine and crack. They are stimulants that are often prescribed for the treatment of intentional problems, narcolepsy, and chronic fatigue. So when they are abused or taken more than what they are intended or prescribed for, um, defines a period of substance use. They release uh, neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, and they also block their re reuptake, causing more of these types of neurotransmitters to be available in the synapse between cells. Quite often, we can see aggressive and inappropriate behavior that results from intoxication and often can lead to involvement with police and arrests. Tolerance and physical dependence happens very quickly for amphetamines. So one has to be very careful. And abuse can actually lead to a larger number of medical issues and serious cardiovascular problems. Uh, not too many people think about nicotine as being a drug, but it is. It, it is under the category of stimulants. Um, and it's used predominantly in the form of cigarettes. It operates both on the central and the peripheral nervous system. And the physiological effects often resemble the fight or flight response. So you can get a sudden rush of your breathing, your awareness, your um, heart patterns um, un while using nicotine. Obviously, we're pretty, uh, the, the causes rather of nicotine and the physical causes are pretty well known, including lung cancer, bronchitis, and coronary heart disease. Caffeine, one might not think of it as a drug. It is a stimulant. It's probably the most heavily used stimulant. It's not as dangerous in terms of intoxication and withdrawal symptoms, but we can see stimulation of central nervous system. We can see increased levels of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin in chronic caffeine users. And it definitely increases metabolism, body temperature, and blood pressure. And we can see those chronic um, can, uh, effects when individuals are actually using a lots of caffeine. Opiates is our next category of drugs that we want to talk about. Derives from the sap of the opium poppy, which is used initially to cure pain. Um, we have really, within the last four or five years, have really become to understand uh, the, the really the extent of opiate use in our communities and its dev devastating effects. Uh, we are currently in an opiate crisis in which there's a tremendous amount of opiates that are misused by individuals and causing significant uh, death rates, mortality rates. Some common examples of opiates are your morphines, your heroines, your codeines, and your methadones. There's um, naturally occurring opiates that we have in our body, um, endorphins that are naturally released, um, usually by exercise, uh, vigorous movement that individuals engage in. They can also be released by and stimulated by uh, mood states. The difference between natural opiates and and opiates that we ingest in our body is natural opiates our mind is used to regulating uh, our brain rather is used to regulating those and recognizing the levels of endorphins and adjusting um, our body's physiological response in a healthy way obviously when we're ingesting opiates it's leading to a state of uh concentration of opiate levels in our body that often our brain and our physical capacities can't keep up with. So it leads to a state of drowsiness, lethar lethargy, slurred speech, clouded mind. It can suppress the respiratory and cardiovascular symptoms to the point of death. And that's what actually what happens in an opiate overdose is, is that it suppresses uh, very quickly your respiratory and cardiovascular systems. This chart is from page 409, gives you uh, a good example of some of the things that I just reviewed in terms of the intoxication symptoms as well as the withdrawal symptoms related to opiates. 
really the use of any substance withdrawal can be profoundly uncomfortable for individuals and it can be profoundly dangerous. Um, when we talk about the withdrawal from alcohol, uh, as being dangerous, the withdrawal from opiates can be just as uh, uncomfortable and certainly just as dangerous. Hallucinogens, PCP, cannabis, we've, we kind of have the last three categories of drugs that we're going to use all on the same screen. The hallucinogens are a, a, a mixed group of substances. Um, and include a wide variety of, of different things, in, including LSD. Most often, the hallucinogens produce perceptual changes, and even in very small doses can produce different visual hallucinations and, and perceptual changes. And we often often refer to the hallucinogenics, uh, the hallucinogens as uh, the psychedelic drugs. PCP, it's manufactured as a powder. It could be snorted or smoked. It's also known as angel dust. Has, it has many of the same uh, effects as the uh, hallucinogens um, and the psychedelics. Cannabis, last but not le least, are leaves that are cut, dried, and rolled into cigarettes and inserted into food or beverages. Um, and obviously, they can be smoked in cigarette form. They increase the risk of chronic cough, uh, senioritis, bronchitis, uh, and emphysema, which is a, a lung condition. Um, most individuals uh, nowadays have clouded uh, ideas and misperceptions about the health consequences of cannabis. And many individuals are now into medical marijuana where they have a prescription from their physician to use cannabis for medicinal purposes. I think we have to remember whether it's uh, recreational use, whether it's prescribed, or whether it's being used for medicinal purposes. Uh, there's significant health risks that come along with the, with the chronic use of, of cannabis. Um, here's a little slide of its own, a um, little bit of overlap from what I just uh, described in the previous slide. Uh, right now, cannabis is actually the most commonly used illegal drug in, in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, certainly in some, in a few U.S. states, it has been legalized, but the majority of states in the United States, cannabis does remain an illegal drug. And as I mentioned before, it can cause um, not only significant medical issues, but it also can significantly impair one's cognitive and motor functioning with chronic use. Okay, let's go to the inhalants as a category of drugs. Um, very volatile substances that produce vapors uh, which can be inhaled. Um, inhalants rapidly reach the lungs and bloodstream and brain and they can very quickly depress the central nervous system. Uh, chronic use has very profound and permanent damage in individuals that consistently use inhalants, uh, mostly permanent damage that's related to central nervous functioning. It also can cause significant uh, degeneration of the brain, um, leading to significant cognitive deficits, often looking like that of dementia, where memory is profoundly impaired. Um, often the ability to speak and understand language is profoundly repair, uh, impaired. And death as well can result from a real depression of both respiratory and cardiovascular symptoms, uh, systems rather, very similar to what happens with the opiate use disorders. And there's a table as well in your book that gives a little bit of an idea about what are some of the intoxication symptoms that are present and what does it look like in, with inhalants. So generally, um, the brain appears to have its own uh, pleasure pathway. And um, the effects of our experience of rewards is very rich um, and is involves the neurotransmitter of dopamine. And so 
drugs um, affect this pleasure pathway in the brain in in various ways um, and either influence that pleasure pathway to uh, produce levels of dopamine that can affect um, our mood significantly and can affect our uh, gait and can affect our ability to speech. So that, that pleasure pathway really moves through the limbic system and releases and affects that neurotransmitter dopamine. And one is also one also believes that that is the pathway in which addiction occurs is manipulating that pleasure pathway that involves the dopamine receptors. So let's talk about some of the theories about how substance use disorders come to be. How do they develop? There is a great deal of information in the, in the literature and the research that shows us there are biological factors. Um, and usually chronic use of psychoactive substances really results in the alteration of these reward centers that I described a moment ago, um, which not only creates an ongoing feeling of craving, um, but can reinforce um, drug use because um, the dopamine uh, receptor receptors in the brain become less sensitive. Um, it may also explain why um, more of a substance is needed um, to have desired effect. If you have um, reward centers in the brain that um, over time have a dulling effect with chronic use of substances, um, then one needs to influence their or increase rather their amount of use um, to get the same desired effect over time. I've already explained that substance use has very adverse effects on both biochemical and brain systems. Um, you know, cravings can also be associated with external cues. Um, they can also involve uh, locations or seeing paraphernalia. Um, stress, even environmental stress, can also activate the brain and increase one's uh, level of cravings. We know that there's genetic factors that are also related to the rewarding effects of substances. All studies basically show that genetics plays a role in determining who is at risk. In some studies, there is a 50% attributable rate to genetic risk. Um, there's some psychological factors that are believed to contribute to the development of substance use disorders. Um, let's talk about modeling from parents and important others. Um, we know that even very young children um, of adults who drink can identify drinks, can often call drinks by, by their names, um, and can mimic behavior in their play related to drinking and smoking. Um, so we know that learning comes from modeling of parents and important others. We also know in terms of psychological factors that boys are more likely to learn uh, their substance use behaviors from older males. And they are more common, um, use rather is more common among males um, than females. People's expectations of alcohol effects and their beliefs about the appropriateness of it to cope with stress can also influence use. Those who believe that alcohol can help them relax, those who believe that alcohol has coping potential, are those who are at, in, are those who are at increased risk of developing a substance use disorder. People also with high levels of behavioral under control, right? Individuals that are extremely active, individuals that have a very difficult time relaxing, um, individuals that are, are uh, susceptible to mood swings. Um, really, we see some connections between individuals that have these types of behavioral uncontrollable uh, issues, uncontrolled disorders, and the rate at which they use drugs. They tend to use drugs at an earlier age. They tend to in ingest more psychoactive drugs, and they are more likely to be diagnosed with substance use disorders. There's a few sociological uh, sociocultural rather factors that are worth uh, pointing out. And we know that um, 
sociocultural factors point to the reinforcing effects that substances attract. So for example, um, people who live in poverty, um, women who are in abusive relationships, adolescents whose parents fight frequently and violently can be attract it to alcohol. And often it is described by them as a way to escape or cope. So individuals that are in these three types of situations are at increased risk for substance use disorders. There's also some subtler environmental reinforcements and punishments that might influence people's substance use habits. We know that some societies encourage excessive drinking and irresponsible behavior, whether that be through social media or social gatherings, or belief systems amongst communities and families. There's a few gender differences that are notable. Um, More acceptable for men in our societies to use substances. Um, Often people say or are quick to believe that it's the more masculine thing to do, have a beer with some of the guys, uh, let off some steam. Women are less likely than men to carry risk factors for substance abuse disorders. Um, They're less likely to have those personality traits um, that make them more susceptible to turn to alcohol and drugs for coping. Um, We also know that women suffer alcohol-related physical illnesses like cirrhosis and the other at lower levels of exposure to alcohol. So although women are less at risk to carry factors for substance abuse disorder, they are at more risk to develop alcohol-related related physical illnesses more quickly. Women also feel intoxicated at lesser amounts of drugs, um, which may in fact reduce their consumption, but also makes their consumption risky because they may feel uh, desired effects quicker Um, and at times can overdose quicker because of such. Um, And the reasons and patterns for substance abuse differ for men and women. Men tend to use in the context of social gatherings, and women tend to initiate use more um, often with family members. There are a ton of treatments that are available for substance abuse disorder. The biological treatments, there are a variety of anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants, and drugs and antagonists that can be used to help someone um, recover from the use of substances. Um, There's different psychosocial treatments. Sorry, this slide is is a little uh, messed up again. Uh, the psychosocial treatments are, are generally categorized in the categories of behavioral, cognitive, and uh, treatments and motivational interviewing. There's more about those in the book if you'd like to, to focus on those. There's a lot of relapse prevention programs that are available for individuals um, that not only involve abstinence or not using a substance, but also focus on... Um, teach people how to use uh, moderately, um, or also teach people from a relapse prevention that alcohol abuse is viewed as temporary slips situationally caused and can uh, recover from from relapses. Um, One area not spoken enough about, in my opinion, are prevention programs. And that's really from the belief of the best uh, way to prevent substance use disorders is to really stop them before they start. Um, 25% of people um, with alcohol use uh, seek treatment. 25% of those that seek treatment, uh, I'm sorry, 25% of people with alcohol use disorders seek treatment, 25% actually recover on their own um, without seeking treatment, which means the remainder of the individuals to carry those problems later on in their life. So that's about 50% or half of the individuals that um, have um, drinking related problems and and substance use disorders, um, don't seek treatment, don't ever recover and carry those problems later in life. Adults between the ages of 18 and 24 have the highest rate of alcohol consumption. 
Hence, there's been a lot of programs on college campuses that have been geared towards reducing drinking and drinking-related problems. Actually, consumption amongst this age group of 18 to 24-year-olds is our largest group of problem drinkers. There's some limitations that I think college uh, students and individuals between the ages of 18 and 24 have. Most um, students dislike admitting the fact that they have, uh, that they're powerless or that they've adopted a lifelong abs or they have to adopt a lifelong abstinence problem. Uh, many of the treatments that we have that call for abstinence, uh, young individuals have a hard time identifying with those models. Um, so sometimes, uh, young individuals can engage more readily into uh, models that we call harm reduction, where the focus is on educating on the immediate risk of excessive use and talk a little bit about the payoffs of moderation, um, talk a little bit and try to teach uh, moderate use. Um, so it challenges um, effects of drinking on social skills and sexual prowess, right? So educating young individuals about the fact that um, you don't have to engage in drinking to become more socially adept or socially comfortable. It teaches alternative ways for reducing negative emotional states. So individuals that are see themselves as turning to alcohol as a way to cope, harm reduction model has been very effective for them. It also teaches role plays to help address peer pressure in high risk situations. Uh, many young people um, have difficulty of handling themselves um, amongst their peers, um, have difficulty saying no, um, have difficulty in not, partake, not partaking in drugs or um, alcohol, yet still participating in, um, in parties and social gatherings. So um, a lot of role playing with the therapist and the client can be done to practice these types of situations so that when uh, young individuals are in and feeling peer pressure and feeling and in high risk situations, they have um, a way in which they can practice and, and engage moderate use um, rather than excessive use in that particular situation. I want to finish this particular chapter um, very briefly talking about the um, gam talking about gambling disorder. And uh, the criteria for a gambling disorder is on table in Table 9 on page 422. Although there might be a lot of individuals that um, engage in periodically in periodic gambling, periodic betting, enjoying the casino every now and then, um, less than 1% of the U.S. population actually meet the diagnostic criteria for gambling disorder. And really what differentiates the problem gambler from that that's not is you is this persistent and recurrent gambling behavior that leads to clinically significant impairment or distress. Um, so like all the other psych, psych, psychiatric disorders and psychological disorders, we're really looking for symptoms that show chronic impairment on somebody's functioning level in order to qualify for the diagnosis. It's often very common that pathological gamblers also have a ton of issues and problems with other substance use, depression, anxiety. They often have a significant family history of substance abuse and gambling problems. Uh, gambling is more prevalent and common in men than women. And we see the same brain uh, pleasure pathway engaged and become light up and stimulate it um, with gambling the same way in the same brain areas that are engaged and lit up and, um, and, and stimulate it with substance abuse. So really we in the last uh, decade or so have really nailed down gambling to be a highly addictive and um, you know uh, just as a uh, problematic problem as, um, as substance use. So that um, finishes uh, chapter 14. Um, I know we still have uh, chapters 13 and 15 to do in our uh, in our class as we're nearing down some of our topics. Um, so stay tuned, and those chapters will um, will come soon. Take care and speak soon.